OK, so you've just gotten back test two. Uh, here's the grade distribution. The average was 83. 83. So it certainly was not a lower than expected average. The average was, in fact, higher than expected. Uh, this distribution roughly matches the distribution from this test last semester uh, in the overall shape. The bottom tail is a little bit higher, uh, but that's it. You're welcome to pick up your tests while I'm talking. It's okay. Yeah, please, if you haven't picked up your test, you might as well come on up. We'll, we'll run it casual because I don't know about you, but I am at the very last legs of my mental capacity, so we're doing things a little bit casual uh, for the end of the semester. Uh, yeah. OK, so the distribution of marks. I have not yet posted the answers. I will post the answers when I get home tonight, if that's OK. Uh, so questions about, oh, yes, sorry. And there's one, uh, there was one more error on this test. Uh, question uh, seven for the symbolization. I believe that's, there's two versions. I believe it's question seven in both versions. It's the question, all the people were at, at the party were yelling, except for John and Mary, were whispering, and nobody could hear them. So to do that question properly, to really, really get it, what you needed was the identity relation. You needed to say, for all of the people at the party, except for those who are not identical with uh, John and Mary. And that's not a thing that I taught you, the identity relation. Sorry, we, we forgot while we were designing these that you hadn't got the identity relation. Usually that's included as part of this course with identity. Identity and operators are usually part of the symbolization process for this course. But we've decided not to teach you those these, this semester to simplify things. Uh, that obviously made things somewhat harder. But uh, so everybody got three marks on that question. That was our, once again, Approaching this with maximum generosity because it was our mistake. So that's what's, that's what's going on with that question. Uh, yeah. Definitely feeling the white hot sting of failure on that one. Believe me. OK. Any questions about test two kind of thing? I mean, broad questions, not questions about why you got the exact mark that you got. Feeling OK? OK. So the very last class, the class on Wednesday, I'll be going over the content of the exam in detail. So I'll go through how many of each type of question there will be. I'll give you examples of each type of question. Uh, I'll show you exactly what the question will look like on the exam. Uh, also, you probably are interested in what our error checking methods are, having had two problematic questions on this test. So I've had three TAs, now all three of the five TAs have now gone through all of the symbolization questions and verified that they are solvable and that they are sensible. And the derivations and invalidities I can check mechanically on Logic 2010. So I have done all of that. Uh, we have triple checked that the exam will not have errors on it. So. I don't know if that makes you feel better or worse, because if there's no errors, then I was just marking you on the answers you give rather than giving away marks. But that's what we've been doing. So there won't be this type of problem on the exam that you saw on test two. And again, I do apologize. I'd like to thank you all for maintaining what appears to me that you've maintained alphabetical order in these piles. So thank you very much. Thank you for your consideration for your fellow students. We all appreciate it, uh, especially those of you who are listening to this as a recording, and we're going to want to come to my office hours to pick up test two. So if you didn't just pick up test two, you can come to my office hours and pick it up. And when you do so, they will still be in alphabetical order, which will be nice for you. OK. Good to go? Questions? OK. So today I'm going to teach you the last thing that I'm going to teach you in this course. This is it. This is the last stuff. Uh, we're going to do multiplace invalidities, and then we're going to do expansions, which make multiplace invalidities much, much easier to solve, in my opinion. So we'll just do the idea of multiplace invalidities. I'll do one quick example, and then I'll show you the expansion method, which makes these much easier to solve. So uh, sorry, I'm, I'm also missing my wireless mic, so I'll be podium bound for this lecture. 
So in multi-place predicate logic, you can't just put an object into a two-place relation, right? It doesn't make sense to say of a relation that it's satisfied by one single object just sitting there. So what does a multi-place relation, multi-place predicate apply to? Two objects, of course. So for example, suppose that we've got the two-place predicate f likes a likes b. So f is a likes b. Uh, and we've got this argument. We've got an argument with one premise and one conclusion. The argument is everybody likes some generic person. Therefore, there exists a specific person who everybody likes. Let's assume all of the objects in the universe of discourse are people. So we've got a premise, a conclusion, and a universe of discourse that contains exactly three objects, all of which are people, Amy, Lee, and Vic. OK. So that's a multi-place argument. And we're going to ask ourselves whether this is a valid or invalid argument. Let's try to show this is, in fact, an invalid argument. Let's try to show that it is, in fact, invalid using this universe of discourse. So here's the solution. But let's walk through and show you why that's a solution. So uh, notice that the things that we put into the predicate are no longer just objects separated by commas. They're what we need, what we call ordered pairs. So in those pointy brackets, the thing inside them is an ordered pair where the order matters. You can't just flip them around. So uh, Amy likes Lee is not the same sentence, of course, as Lee likes Amy, right? Once again, much heartbreak would be solved if they were the same sentences, but they're not. So what I claim is that that thing on the bottom of the bottom left there is uh, an example that shows that this is an invalid argument. Uh, so uh, let's look at the premise first. Let's ask ourselves what would make. So to show that this is invalid, what we need to do is, of course, just like with single place, make all the premises true and the conclusion false, right? That shows that the argument is invalid. If that's possible, that shows that the argument is invalid. Um, so premise one says, for all objects in the universe of discourse, there exists at least one object such that uh, x likes y. So for everything that you could possibly substitute in for x, there is at least one thing that you can substitute in for y. Right? So do we think that that's true? Is that true given this assignment of value? So, uh, suppose we want to substitute in for x Amy. So we, let's fix that in our minds. x equals Amy. Now, does there exist a y such that Amy likes that thing? Yes, Lee. OK. So that's if we substitute Amy, it works. How about Lee? Is there, does there exist a thing? So fix x as Lee now. Does there exist a thing such that Lee likes that thing? Yes, Vic. And of course, now we're going to substitute in Vic for x. We ask, does there exist at least one thing such that uh, Vic likes that thing? Yes. Amy. Yeah? So that premise is true. Given this, given this universe of discourse and this assignment of objects to the relation f, premise, the premise is true. Uh, Notice that it's a much more complicated process to verify that the premise is true now. Of course, it's a much, we have to do this, if there's two quantifiers, you have to deal with both of them in, in series. OK, now let's do the conclusion. So is the conclusion true? It says there exists some y such that every object x likes that y. So it says there is some specific person that everybody likes. Now, is there a specific person within the assignments in F that everybody likes? Does everybody like Amy? Well, we didn't say so. And if we don't attribute a property, if we don't attribute truth to the assignment, we assume falsity. So given F, we assume that Lee doesn't like Amy because we didn't say that Lee likes Amy. 
OK, so not everybody likes Amy. Does everybody like Lee? No, we didn't say everybody likes Lee. And does everybody like Vic? No, no, we didn't say that everybody likes Vic. We didn't assign, that tr we didn't assign the, the value true to uh, Amy likes Vic, Lee likes Vic, and uh, Vic likes Vic. You can, of course, like yourself. Uh, it's true, I promise. OK. OK, so then the conclusion is false, because it is not true that there exists any person such that every person likes them. OK, so we've shown a multi-place invalidity. Have any questions about that? Because I, I don't really have too much more to say about the very idea of multi-place invalidities. I'll show you a bunch of examples, but I think there's not, there's not too much sort of technical stuff to learn about this. It's not that different than single-place invalidities. I mean, technically. Is that all right? OK. The thing that's hard about multi-place invalidities is keeping this stuff all in your head at once. I find this to be, I mean, I've gone through this example before, which is why it was fairly fluid. But the first time I went through this example, it was very taxing on my working memory. It was too much to hold in my head all at once, frankly. If you can just, if you can just see the answer here, bless your heart, feel free to more or less tune out. But like, actually don't, because I'm going to make you do this following thing on the exam. But, uh, Here's, if, you, if you find this to be taxing, here's another tool that you can use. Sorry, so this is just that thing, but with numbers instead of people. Expansions. This is the very last thing I'm going to teach you in this course. Expansions. And I find these to, make, uh, to be the ideal tool for working through multi-place invalidities. It's a nice way of thinking about the quantifiers to make it clear. It will also, in kind of retrospect, make it clear why that stuff we did in multi-place symbolization is the way it is. So uh, I told you that if you put the existen if the existential has wide scope, that has a very different meaning than if the universal has wide scope. And I had to kind of vaguely gesture at the existence of expansions to explain why that might be the case. Today we're going to do expansions, and hopefully it will be fairly clear why the scope matters to the meaning of the sentence. OK. So um, when you're doing expansion, when you're doing invalidities, I'm going to make you work out what the universe of discourse is. I'm going to leave, I'm going to give you the UD, and I'm going to give you the open bracket. It's going to be up to you to write the closed bracket when you think you've got enough objects. We're doing expansions. You need to know ahead of time how big the universe of discourse is. So I'll, I'll give you the universe of discourse ahead of time. Given a universe of discourse, it's quite possible to rewrite the sentences that contain quantifiers in entirely qu unquantified terms. So we can translate quantified sentences into unquantified sentences. So I mean, and assuming you've got, I mean, it, there's practical limits on this, of course. If, you had the, if your universe of discourse was the actual universe, you would never get through writing an expansion. There's too many objects. Uh, in multiplayer, and just as a side note for a thing that we're not going to do, but maybe, I, maybe we could have, in multi-place invalidities, it's sometimes necessary that there be an infinite universe of discourse. To demonstrate the invalidity, sometimes you need an infinite universe of discourse. Rest assured that I'm not going to do that to you on the exam. It'll be all finite universes of discourse. Okay. Okay. So let's do expansions. Let's talk about expanding a universal, rewriting a universally quantified sentence without the universal quantifier. So recall that what a universal quantifier says. It says, for everything in the universe of discourse, uh, the sentence holds true. So you could substitute in any object into the variable that's being quantified over and have a true sentence come out. So in a sense, a universal quantifier is really just a shortened form of a long series of conjunctions. It's saying, for this object, it's true. And for that object, it's true. And for this object, it's true. So we're literally going to rewrite our universals into 
We're not going to use letters, but just, I mean, you just get it intuitively. If you've got names for all the objects in the universe, then the universal saying, if A has the property F, then G has the property F. A, sorry, if A has the property F, then A has the property G. And if B has the property F, then B has the property G. And, 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 and for all the objects in the universe. So when we're doing invalidities, we're just going to translate the quantified sentence into an unquantified sentence. OK. And then existentials, hopefully you recall. What the existential says is, this object has the property, or this object has the property, or this object has the property. So there exists an x such that hx and, hx and jx says either a has both the property h and j, or b has the property h and j, or c has the property h and j, and so on. So we're going to translate our existentials into a series of disjunctions. Yeah? OK. So given a reasonably small, just for practical limitations, given a reasonably small universe of discourse, we can go ahead and rewrite our quantified sentence in unquantified terms. OK. So here's an example. Here's the first expansion I'm going to show you. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. We've got one quantifier. We've got for all x, fx, then gx. And suppose our universe of discourse has got three objects in it, 0, 1, and 2. That third line there says the same thing as the universal quantifier, given that universe of discourse. We just rewrite the sentence, substituting in each of the objects and putting ands between the sentence, between the sentences. Yeah? Is that, is it clear why that's a, how those two sentences are saying the same thing given that universal discourse? Okay. It's probably not obvious why we're doing this yet, but hang on, we'll get to it. We'll get to that. So we didn't, I mean, that doesn't, massively increase our clarity here, but let's get a little more complicated and it will be more obvious why this is a useful technique. Uh, just to show you the, the existential version of this, of course, it's just disjunctions. Uh, notice that the brackets matter a lot here. Uh, if, there, if those brackets, if in the third line those brackets wouldn't there, it would just be a, a, a misformed sentence, right? We want that sentence to be true just in case H0 and J0 is true, or blah, 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 blah. Yeah. OK. So this becomes much more useful, much more obviously useful, when we get into sentences with more than one quantifier in them. And the trick to doing this is basically just to take one quantifier at a time. So it, sometimes doing an expansion involves several steps, uh, one step for each quantifier you're looking to eliminate. Okay, so here's a sentence with two quantifiers in it, and I've expanded it in two steps. The first line there is, of course, the quantified sentence. The very top line is the quantified sentence. The second line, I've eliminated the existential that's out front. And I've eliminated the existential out front just by replacing every instance of x with first with 0, and then replacing every instance of x with 1, and just putting a disjunction between those two sentences. So this is for a universe of discourse of two objects, obviously. And if it was three objects, then I'd have a, sec a, a third disjunct there, g2, then for all y, f, 2y, and so on and so on and so on. OK, but that middle, that middle line there clearly still has a quantifier in it. And then we expand that quantifier in the next step. So expanding the universal, notice that we kind of expand from within the sentence. So on the third line, that disjunction is still the major connective of the sentence. Right? That disjunction is still the major connective. 
we don't say take the whole disjunct and make two copies of it. We expand from within. Uh, that's Expanding from within is an artifact of my preferred way of doing expansions, which is to start at the outermost quantifiers and work my way in. You could, there's no logical reason why you couldn't start on the innermost quantifiers and expand them. So if I'd started on the innermost quantifier, the second line would look different, but the third, li third line would be the same. Yeah. Questions so far? Okay. Okay. So just before, I'm going to spend most of this, the rest of this class just doing examples. Before we get into examples, I want to go back to the stuff about generic and specific. Uh, so remember in symbolization, if the existential gets wide scope, we're saying there's some specific object that has this property. And if the existential is buried inside of a universal, we're saying there's some generic object that has this property. So here's why that difference exists. I can show you explicitly why that difference exists now. Okay. So A is a story, B is a twist, and C means that A has B. Suppose I wanted to say that every story has some generic twist. That would be for all X. If something is a story, then there exists some thing such that it's a twist, and the story has that thing. Yeah? That's familiar from the... This is all familiar from symbolizing ambiguous sentences, right? And then if I wanted to say that there's some specific twist, so the first sentence there just says, every story has some twist or other. Maybe it's not the same twist. Maybe one story the butler did it, maybe another story they were ghosts all along, so on and so forth, right? So there's just at least one twist. The second one says, every single story has the same twist. There is some specific twist that every story has. Very boring world if that was the case, but uh, that would be that there exists a Y such that it's a twist, and for everything that's a story, it has that twist. Okay, so this is all familiar. We've done this before, yeah? Okay, so now let's do expansions on these two sentences and look at how different they are. Look at the different claims that gets made by those two sentences. So here's the, here's the one where, going off the edge of the page there, Better? Okay. So this is our uh, every story has some generic twist. So for all x, there, if it's a story, then there exists something such that it's a twist. And let's suppose that there are two objects in this universe. We'll do an expansion on it. So uh, the universal, if it has wide scope, that means that the major connective of the fully expanded sentence is going to be a conjunction. It's going to say if zero is a story, then it has a twist. And if one is a story, then it has a twist. That existential is going to be expanded from within, and it's going to just say there's at least one twist such that it's in the story. Maybe it's one, maybe it's zero. Okay, so if the universal gets wide scope, that means that the whole sentence is going to end up being a conjunction or a series of conjunctions. This is going to be useful when you're doing expansions because you just keep this in mind because when you're done doing the expansions, you're going to have a lot of brackets, a lot of often a lot of mix of ands and ors, and you need to know what the major connective of your expanded sentence is. And the rule is, if the universal was the mate had the widest scope in the sentence, the major connective is going to be a conjunction. Now compare that to this other sentence where the existential takes wide scope. Now the major connective is going to be a disjunction. It's going to say either zero is a story and it has a twist or one is a story and it has a twist. So the difference between giving the universal or the existential wide scope is the difference between having a sentence that overall is a conjunction versus having a sentence that overall is a disjunction. Those are, and those two types of sentences couldn't be more different, right? 
OK. So that's why, when we're doing symbolizing of ambiguous sentences, the difference between a universal inside an existential and an existential inside a universal makes a big difference to the meaning of the sentence. Yeah? OK. So that's a broadly intellectual conclusion of deepening your understanding of what we're doing here. But that's not why you come to logic classes. You come here to solve problems, right? So let's solve some problems, shall we? Let's just head on to examples. Unless there's questions about that, let's do some examples. OK. And through the examples, it will become clear. Because I still haven't told you why this is useful for doing invalidities. You haven't, that hasn't been demonstrated to you. So through the examples, it should hopefully become clear why it is that uh, this stuff is useful for solving invalidities. OK. So it's up here. All right. So we'll assume a universe of discourse. Again, on the, on the example, I'll just give you the universe of discourse. Let's assume a universe of discourse with two objects. Yeah? You need to know ahead of time, otherwise you don't know how many disjuncts to do. But OK. So we'll do an expansion of premise one. We don't, these are not quantified sentences. These sentences, premise two and the conclusion, have no quantifiers in them. So they are not candidates for, be, for being expanded, right? You, can only expa you only expand a quantified sentence into a, quanti a sentence with no quantifiers, right? That's what we do. That's what we do. We eliminate quantifiers to get us, ourselves a longer but equivalent sentence. If there's no quantifier, then there's no expanding to be done. So we really just have to expand premise one here. And I'm going to start from the outside, I'll, as, as is my standard practice. I'm going to start by eliminating the quantifier with the widest scope, which is this universal. OK. So to eliminate a universal, we rewrite it by substituting in this object, x, for each member of this thing, and then putting a conjunction between them. So we've got uh, if f0 by conditional, uh, there exists a y such that r 0 y. Yeah. And I'll put brackets around that whole thing so I don't get confused. And if f1 by conditional, there exists a y such that r, oh, don't put that bracket, r. 1y. OK. So step one of our expansion. Yeah? When your second premise, a and b, are variables, so do you include them in your universal discourse? Yeah. 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 Yeah
one zero for R one one. Bracket. Okay. So this is our final expansion of premise one. We've rewritten that sentence with two quantifiers into a sentence with zero quantifiers in it. Okay. So here's where this becomes useful. So let's now do an invalidity on this thing where we try to show that the argument is invalid. And we can do that by using the expanded sentence rather than trying to figure out how to do an invalidity with this thing, which frankly I find a little bit cognitively daunting. We're going to try to make this thing true. And that will be hopefully more straightforward. OK, so we'll just do our invalidity the same way that we did before. We need to tell, we need to figure out what the uh, content of the F predicate is and what the content of the R predicate is. Um, if you prefer, if it helps you, you can do the following. You just make a little chart for yourself. So F0, F1. R0, 0, 0, R0, 1, R1, 0, R1, 1. Okay. Yeah? And we're going to assign, this is already sort of, we've assigned A to 0 and B to not 0, 1. Okay. So now it's just a matter of making, just like with the other invalidities we did, we're going to make this thing true, this thing true, and this thing false. Yeah? OK. Start with the conclusion, maybe, because it's fairly straightforward. Uh, R, A, B needs to be false. So A is 0 and B is 1. So R, 0, 1 needs to be false. and R10 needs to be false. So that's false and that's false. Yeah? OK. Let's deal with premise two here. So F0 must be true and F1 must be true. OK, now let's deal with this thing. Now let's deal with this thing. So we need to make this conjunction, recall, so the universal is out front. That means this whole sentence is a conjunction. To make a conjunction true, of course, you have to make both of the conjuncts true. So we need to make both of these sentences true. So we know in this case that F0 has got to be true, given the way that we assigned names to things. So if this is true, to make this biconditional true, this has also got to be true, right? So R00 or R01 need to be true. We've already said that R01 is false, which means that we need R00 to be true in order to make the biconditional true. And we need the biconditional, so we need, we need this disjunction to be true to make the biconditional true because F0 is true. OK? OK, so we've made this conjunct true. Now let's make the other one true. So if F1, we've already said F1 is going to be true. So we need th the, to make the biconditional true, we need to make this thing true. F1, 0, we've already said is false. So that means that we need R11 to be true. And there we've done it. OK, to write this into an answer, we'll still do this thing. So we'll say the extension of F is 1 and 0, or 0 and 1. Now, to write out these, uh, these things as an answer here, we need the order pairs. So R0, 0, so the ordered pair of 0 and 0, and the ordered pair of 1 and 1. Both need to be true. And there. So that here is our answer. How's that? Was it clear how the expansion helped us deal with the invalidity? Like, I hope that, 
I hope that's helpful to you in dealing with these things. It's, it makes it a more step-by-step -step process, whereas dealing with a multi-place premise with like more than one quantifier can be really daunting, because it's just a lot to keep in your head at once. But if you do the expansion, it kind of takes it back to the good old, like almost sentential logic skills that you were familiar with of just, OK, I need this thing to be true, so I'll make that thing true. I need this thing to be false, so I'll make that thing false, and so on like that. Yeah? OK. Any questions about that? Yeah? I just randomly assigned them. So the, the question was, is there a strategy to assigning uh, things to A and B? I just randomly assigned them. Um, the guess and check strategy. Tragically, it's a, kind of, it's a kind of like lowest point in strategy, but it's generally good enough for dealing with this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that we could not have made A and B the same object in this case. So here's a, here's a bit of reasoning for why it had to be that way rather than another way. If this is, it's not a, it's not a strategy because it's not general, but I can at least give you a specific answer for this question. If we'd made A and B the same object, then R0, 0, uh, and so that would make this R0, 0, or R0, 0. Uh, and we needed R0, 0, 0 to be true. We needed, in this case, uh, R0, 0, 0 to work out as true, but that would make this conclusion true which makes this not an invalidity, which was the goal. So that's why it wouldn't have been a good idea to make A and B the same object in this case. I don't think it makes any difference whether A is 1 and B is 0 or vice versa. But so local, I don't have a general strategy for you, unfortunately, but local guessing and checking and decision making is probably as good as you can get. So the plan for the rest of the class is just to do a bunch more examples of this stuff. OK. Right, so here's the thing. Here's the thing where we need to expand both the premises, premise and the conclusion. Um, and we're going to assume, uh, as I so hastily scrawled out, that the universe of discourse contains 0 and 1. OK, so and of course, once we've done the expansions, we'll go ahead and do the invalidity. And that's just to use the expansions to show that the argument is invalid. Okay. So let's go ahead with the premise. Uh, we're going to replace every instance of x with every object and conjoin those sentences together. So f 0a by conditional g 0b. OK, put that whole thing in brackets. and f 1a whew, by conditional g 1b brackets. OK, that one was pretty easy. There's only one quantifier, so we only have to do, we only take one step in expanding it. So far, so good. OK. So let's expand the conclusion, which has two quantifiers, so it's going to take two steps. There's the premise. We'll do the conclusion. OK. And as I usually do, I'm going to start uh, from the outside and work my way in, just the way I like to do it. OK. So there exists a y such that I'm going to replace every instance of x with the first object. and g 0 y and let's go like that I'm going to say or because I'm doing an existential there exists a y such that f 1 y and g 1 y okay so step one complete we've eliminated the first existential now let's eliminate the second existential, starting with this sentence. So we're just going to go through and replace every instance of 
y with the object g 0 0 or so brackets are crucial here because we've got a mix of ands and ors f 0 1 and g 0 1 Okay, so that's this sentence here is the expansion of this sentence, and we'll do the let's do the other one. Or f one zero and g one zero, or f one one and g one one. Okay. Okay. So there's our expansion. We have rewritten both the premise and the conclusion in a form that does not include any quantifiers. Now let's do the invalidity. So what do we got here? We've got we need to get we need to figure out what f is. So we got f00 as a possibility, f01, f10, f11. And of course, the same for G. G00, G01, G10, and G11. And we have to figure out what A and B are. Okay. Come on now. Much better. Well, sort of. Oh, man. This is, this is not going well at all. All right, that experiment didn't go well at all. All right. OK, so let's start thinking about this stuff. Um, so the premise, we need to make this premise true, right? So we need to make this conjunction true, which means I have to make both halves of this thing true. OK. So what are we going to do to make that true? Again, my usual, my usual way of dealing with these names is really just to assign them kind of at random and see if it works, and then go back and change it if it doesn't. So I'm going to go ahead and assign to a to 0 and b to 1, just to have something to start from, and then I can see if it works. So. That makes this sentence, uh, if f 0, 0 by conditional g 0, 1, and that makes this sentence f 1, 0 by conditional g 1, 1. OK. OK. So how am I going to make this thing true? f 0, 0 and g 0, 1. Well, right now it's true already, right? So if I don't write anything in these, then like if I don't assign uh, true to an to a ordered pair, then it defaults to false, right? So if I do nothing, let's say f00 is false, and g10 is 0, 001 is false. Let's just assume that. So now they're both false. This biconditional is true. All right. Uh, and f10 by conditional g11, f10, I might as well assume that's false, and g11 is false. I'm, I'm just writing stuff. At this point, I'm literally just writing stuff down, whatever works. I haven't decided that this is my final answer yet. I'm just trying stuff and seeing, seeing where it takes me. Uh, also good life advice, I might, I might add. OK. so. Now let's deal with this conclusion. OK, so the conclusion needs to be false. That's harder to do, right? To make a, con a disjunction false, we're going to have to do some work, right? We need to make all of the disjuncts false. So all this has to be false, and this has to be false, and this has to be false, and this has to be false. Whew. So. What do you recommend? 
Just put false for everything. Why not? Why not? I see no reason why that does not work. What do you think? OK, so let's write out the answer in a kind of nicer way. This is all. So when you're doing an expansion, this counts as, I mean, all this stuff is part of your answer. Uh, it would be helpful if you could uh, maybe draw a box around what you consider your final answer, just because it's a bit of a visual mess. So, and this would be our final answer for this. OK, so what do we got here? We've got, given this universe of discourse, what falls under the F predicate? Literally nothing. What falls under the G predicate? Also nothing. And A stands for 0, and B stands for 1. Uh, there are also, I'm, I'm willing to bet, there are also ways of making this invalid where you assign true to a bunch of things, uh, which is probably what you would have come up with if you'd sort of tried to think this thing through without having done the expansion. You probably would have come up with a more elaborate answer. Like, typically people don't default to just, oh, what if everything's false? But having the expansion in front of you kind of makes it, at least for me anyway, much, much easier to think this stuff through. How's that? Any questions about that? OK, let's try another. OK. So, where's my, oh, there we go. All right. Once again, assuming a universe of discourse with two objects. So, go through, do the expansions, and then we'll do the invalidity. Okay, so premise one. And expand this existential. So stripping away the first existential, we get there exists a y such that f. Oh, let me let me take a little more care with writing these things because it starts to get uninterpretable if I don't. F zero y. Or there exists a y such that f one y. Okay. Step two of the expansion, eliminate these existentials. So f, 0, 0, or f, 0, 1. Or I'll do the, now we'll do this one, f, 1, 0, or f, 1, 1. Hopefully, you can see intuitively why that makes sense as the expansion. The, the original premise says there exists a y, there exists an x, and there exists a y such that x is related to y in the f relation. And really all that premise is saying is there's something that you can stick into f such that it works. And what we've got, the, the final expansion there is just all of the possible ways that you could stick something into f, to stick two, our two objects into f, right? Yeah. So informal notation is OK in cases where informal notation is OK. Um, if, so in this case, because it's just a series of disjunctions, there's nothing to disambiguate. And this, in, as an informal sentence, this would be fine, right? Um, you might, as a matter of care and strategy, find it important to add in the brackets so that you remember what's going on. But if it's, for example, just two existentials, then that means the whole sentence is just going to be a series of disjunctions, and it doesn't matter where the brackets go. So the, yeah, the short answer is informal notation is OK, but you be, better be very confident that informal notation is OK for that sentence. Yeah? Is that fair? OK. OK, so there's our expansion of premise one. Let's do premise two, a somewhat more difficult premise to expand, I have to say. So
I'm, I'm at this point very glad that I gave myself a universe of discourse with only two objects. Uh, more than that would have made this a very large task. OK. So we're going to expand, starting with the outmost universal, placing every instance of y with each object in the universe of discourse. So there exists an x such that f x 0. If that thing is true, then for all x, f 0 y. And if there exists an x such that f x 1, then for all x, f 1 y. No, no. I messed up twice there. Sorry. Here's how I messed up. I replaced the x when I should have replaced the y, because the universal that I'm I'm expanding out is bound to y, not x. Sorry. Uh, so this should be instead f x, 0. And this should be instead f, x, 1. Is that right now? OK. OK, let's continue to expand. We've got more expanding to do here. So. Expanding this thing. Now, um, so we'll strip away. So here's a question. We could do this, we could do the expansion of this and the expansion of that at the same time, or we could do them one after another. Which do you prefer? I'll do it, I'll do them at the same time. I think you can handle it. I mean it's fairly, it's fairly so expanding this, there exists an x such that f x zero. Uh, expands to f zero zero or f one zero, and that is the antecedent of this thing. So this expands to that. We can say then, and now we just need to expand this. So f zero zero and F one zero. Yeah? Okay, so now we've expanded this thing. We say and, and maybe put this whole thing in brackets again. Because we do need to distinguish whether the conjunction or the conjunction or the conditional is the major connective here. And since we started with a universal, we know the universal is going to be, the co conjunction is going to be the major connective of the entire expanded sentence. OK. OK, now we're just going to do the same thing with this. So we've got uh, f01 or f11. And if that thing is true, then, uh, so that's the expansion of this. Now we're going to expand this. F01 and F11. OK. Uh, Okay. Does that, look, does that look okay to everyone? Okay. So now we've expanded premise two. We have fully expanded premise two. Now just to expand the conclusion and we can do our invalidity. Uh, the 
conclusion is nicer to expand. It's only got that one universal. So it's just going to say f0, 0, 0 and f1, 1, 1. Yeah? OK. If we're happy with that as the expansion, then we can do the invalidity. Shall we? OK. So this time we've only got the f predicate to deal with. That means we just need to assign true or false to the following four possibilities. That's right, right? Yeah, it's just f's, just f's. OK, and now we'll just go through and make the premises true and the conclusion false. OK, so how are we going to make these? Premise one is a pretty straightforward one to make true. We're not allowed to have just all falses here, though, are we? That solution won't, will no longer avail us in this scenario. So we need to make at least one of those things true. Why don't we just, for the sake of keeping things simple for ourselves, let's just remember that we need at least one of these things to be true and move on to premise two, which looks harder. We'll deal with premise two, and maybe one of them will have to be true to make premise two true. And then we can just be done, yeah? OK. Uh, we, uh, we can actually sort of, we can mutually constrain. So we know that one of these has to be false. So either this one is false or this one is false. I don't know. Let's just keep that in mind, shall we? And deal with, we'll try to make premise two true, because it looks like the hardest one to deal with. OK. OK, so here is our expansion of premise two. It's a big conjunction, which means we have to make both of these conditionals true, right? A convenient way to make a conditional true is, of course, to make the antecedent false. And then you don't have to think about the consequent. But we're not allowed to do that in this case, are we? There's a reason why we can't make both of those antecedents false. And it's that thing I just said, which is that we need at least one of these things to be true. We need at least one of f0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1 to be true, right? And that makes at least one of these antecedents true. OK, so uh, if f0, 0, 0, or f1, 0, then f0, 0, 0 and f1, 0. So it's, uh, this is essentially a, yeah, saying if you get either of these, then both of them. So let's try some stuff. Let's just try stuff and see how it works, shall we? OK, let's make. Uh, Let's make f10 true. OK, so that makes this conjunct, make this antecedent true. Sorry? I wrote it in the wrong box. I did write it in the wrong box. Thank you. OK, so now this antecedent is true. That means this consequent has to be true as well, meaning f00 must also be true. Foo. OK. Now, we need to make this true as well. But we'd better not make it true by making all of these true, right? Why can't we do that? Because we still need to make the conclusion false. So if I made F, F10 and F11 true, then both F00 and F11 would be true. And that's, that's no good because then our conclusion comes out as true. So that means this has to be false. So if f0, 0 is true, f1, 1 has to be false. If f1, 1 has to be false, uh, then that, this conjunction can't be true, meaning this whole conditional, the only way to make this conditional true is to make the antecedent false. If the conclusion is False. You can't have a true consequent, a true antecedent, and a true conditional. So we need to make f zero one false, 
and F11 false. OK. Let's just go back through one more time, check that we did that right. Uh, so is premise one true? That premise one is true is if at least one of these things are true. Yep, at least one of them is true. Great. Uh, premise two is true because we made this thing true. We made F00 tr is true and F10 is true. So the antecedent is true and the consequent is also true. This one is true because the antecedent is false and the consequent is false. I mean, it's true because just because the antecedent is false. And then this is true because F00 is true, but F11 is false. So the conjunction is false. OK, we did it. We did it. So let's write out the answer. Uh, it's just this. The ordered pair of 0 and 0 and the ordered pair of 1 and 0. A little off the edge of the world there. Yeah? All right. I think I got one more example. Do you want to do one more example? Hooray. We're almost done. You guys, we're almost done. OK. <laughs> OK. Mm, that's a fun one. Yeah. Yeah. I won't be heartbroken. If you, if you stand up and walk out and discuss it, I won't be heartbroken. I am not allowed to. I am being paid to be here. OK. 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 So we got three quantifiers to strip away in the premise one. We'll take them one at a time. We'll get through this because we just have to do it one at a time. All right. And once again, assuming a universe of discourse with 0 and 1. OK. I'm going to write small, though, because I have a feeling that this is going to take some space. OK. So we are missing a bracket here. Assume the bracket went there. OK. So there exists a y for all z, r, zy. Come on now. By conditional g0 and r, z0. Bracket, bracket. And this y, all z, r, z, y, by conditional, g1 and r, z1. OK, step one complete. Let's move on to step two. Stripping away this existential. I'll just, just remind myself that that's the unit we're working with. OK. So for all z, r, z, 0 by conditional g, 0 and r, z, 0. Or for all z, r, z, 1 by conditional g0 and r z0. OK, so that's the expansion of this first line. And we're going to very carefully remind ourselves that the whole thing is still a conjunction, right? The whole thing is still a conjunction. So that's the, this is the major connective of this sentence. OK, now we're going to expand this thing. For all z, r, z0, by conditional, g1, and r, z1. 
4. Carl Z. R. Z. 1. Pi conditional. G1 and R. Z. 1. Okay. Take a little break. Okay. Okay, so these four lines now need to be expanded just one more time, uh, and then we'll have premise one expanded. Whew. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, replacing the Zs with all of the possible things, and then we'll say or, and then we'll say and, and then we'll say or. Okay, so. R, 0, 0, biconditional, G0, and R, 0, 0. Yeah? And R, 1, 0, biconditional, G0 and R, replacing this Z with 0, 0, 0. Okay. Or, R, 1, 1, biconditional, G0 and R, whew, okay, placing Z with one, one, zero. Oh boy, did I do it right? Oh, okay. So now at this point, my eyes are swimming. I'm having trouble remembering where I was, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. Uh, okay, so uh, we can label this stuff, or you can label it for yourself if it helps. So let's call this line one, line two, line three, and line four, yeah? So this is our line one again. This is our line two. So now I'm expanding line two. I've expanded, uh, so. Yeah, no, I, I see I messed it up already. I should be applying zero and one to Z. So that should be R01. And that should be R00. Whew. This is possibly the worst this is the worst sort of activity for somebody like me who's pretty good with the big picture but struggles with details. Uh, maybe that's why we put it at the end. I don't know. Okay, so we're still expanding line two. We've expanded it to zero, and now we're going to do the exact same thing, expanding it to one. So, R, one, one, biconditional, G zero, and R, one, zero. Okay. I believe you. So, wait, yeah, it should be, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this thing or this thing, line one or line two, and, which is still our major connective, move on to line three. Okay, I did this to myself. I picked this question. I did this to myself. Okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, expanding line three, we're gonna place all instances of Z with first zero and then one. So R zero zero biconditional G one and R zero one and 
Now we're going to replace all instances on line 3 of Z with 1. So R10 by conditional G1 and R11. OK. Or, OK, on line 4, we're going to replace first all instances of Z with 0 and then 1. You can tell I'm talking more for my benefit than yours, but it is absolutely necessary, I assure you. R01 and now replacing all instances of Z with 1. 1, 1 by conditional G1 and R11. One, one. Okay. Boy, oh boy. That was fun. All right. So now we've expanded premise one. See how much easier this is, you guys? Oh, man. So easy. OK, now let's expand the conclusion, which is less of a daunting task because it's only got two quantifiers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scroll down a little bit. I'll just rewrite the conclusion a little bit lower, if you don't mind. So there exists an x. Oh. So there exists an x. Make sure I get this right the first time. R, Y, X, by conditional G, Y. OK. So now we've got all the information from down there. OK. Replace that. Now, let's expand the conclusion. So we've got uh, for all Y, replacing all instances of x with first 0, conditional gy, or for all y, r y1 by conditional gy. OK. Does that look good? He asked non-rhetorically. OK. Now let's expand these things. So R00 zero, zero, by conditional G0 and R10 by conditional G1. Or R01 by conditional G0 and R11 one, one by conditional, uh, not R at all, G1. OK. And here again, it is important. This, in this case, it is important to get your brackets right, because we've got some ands and ors mixed together. OK. So I'm going to erase this conclusion, if that's OK. OK, there you have it. We have expanded both our premises, premise, and conclusion. So we don't actually even need to look at the premises and conclusion to do this invalidity. We can just do the invalidity on the expanded version. Uh, I wasn't going to look at them anyway. So let's go ahead and do that. So what do we need here? We need values for uh, g, oh, easy now, g0 and G1, and we need values for R. R00, zero, zero, R01, zero, R10, R11. One, one. OK. Right. OK. So now it's really just, again, fighting down waves of math panic, because you're like, oh my god, I can't deal with this. We're just going to deal with one line at a time, 
figuring out how to make that premise true and the conclusion false. And I'm even going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to erase the unexpanded version of the conclusion just so that there's less to look at. OK. Simplifying for myself whenever possible. OK, so let's look at this premise, yeah? Take a look at this premise, see if we can figure this out. So premise needs to be true. And we recall from way back when we started this thing that the main connective, OK, sorry, we actually do need to look at the premise. Remember that the main outer connective of this thing was a universal. So when I'm trying to figure out what the main connective of this expanded thing is, if you started with a universal, it's going to be the conjunction. If you did it right, the conjunction should end up being the main connective of the sentence. So here's our conjunction. That means that we need these two lines to be true and these two lines to be true. OK, so let's start with the top two lines. Let's start with these top two lines. How do we make these top two lines be true? Well, they're a disjunction, so we only have to make one of those two lines true, right? If we make either of those two lines true, then the whole, both lines come out as true. OK. And then within that, these are both, both of those lines are conjunctions. So we need to make this true and this true. Well, let's see. R0, 0, biconditional, G0, and R0, 0. OK. So far, so good. I mean, if R0, 0, 0 is false, then this is both, then this is false, right? If R1, 0 is false, then this is false. Well, sorry, if, if this is false and both of these are false. So, so far, here's my hypothesis. Make this false, make this false, uh, make this false. And then we've just made this first line true, right? Just by, just by defaulting to false. Does that seem right to you? Yeah. So, uh, oh yeah, that's right. So it doesn't have to be false. So G0 doesn't have to be false to make this work. Yeah. Yeah. Because if R00 is false and R10 is false, then the whole, the biconditional, the conjunction comes out as false, and therefore the biconditional works. So we can even be agnostic so far about this. Okay, so what did we just do? What we just did was make this top line true, meaning these two lines are true. Now we just make, need to make the bottom two lines true, and we will ma have made our premise true. So if R00 is false, then G1 and R01 should be false. And if R10 is false, then G1 and R11 should be false. I mean, so far, just setting these all to false seems like a pretty good start, right? Let's, OK. So setting those all to false so far is working. We've made our premise true just by setting all of the R values to false. OK. Let's not get too excited. Let's now shift to looking at the conclusion and see if that comes out as false as well. So if the conclusion comes out as false, we're golden, we're done. If not, we'll have to, well, we might have to go back and do some adjustments. OK, let's look at the conclusion. So we want to make this conclusion false. It's a disjunction, which means the, these lines both have to turn out to be false. That's got to be false, and that's got to be false. OK. So R0, 0, if and only if G0 and R1, 0, if and only if G1. How are you going to make that false? Set G0, 0, 0 to true. That looks all right. That looks all right. And if we set G1 to true, what does that do? If we set G1 to true, that makes this true, but this false, right? 
So that's good. That's good. So G1 is true. R11 we have is false, making this biconditional false, making this conjunct conjunction false. If this thing is false, then this whole conjunction turns out as false. So now we've made the conclusion false. Yeah? Um, on the exam, will the any questions that you require us to expand the Yes. Yes. So, there's, uh, so the question is, on the exam, are you going to have to do this? So there are a few invalidities where I don't require it, and then a few where I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I am, I am going to make you do this on the exam. Yeah. And those questions will be, do the expansion, and then use the expansion to find the invalidity. Um, I do think that it's helpful for just solving invalidities to do this stuff. I do think so. OK, but hang on. Did we just, I think we just solved this thing. I think we just solved this thing. So by setting all of the r's to false and g1 and g0 to true. So let's just check. Let's, let's make sure. So uh, false, and it's a biconditional with this thing, g0 and r0, 0. One half of the conjunction is false, so this is false. False and false makes true. Uh, I guess it's just it's going to be the same logic on each line, right? This is false, and this conjunction is false because half of it is false, so this is true. True and true gives us true. And it's going to be just the same for every subsequent one, right? That makes sense? OK, OK, so here's our answer. Uh, the G predicate applies to, oh, that is a bad bracket, uh, applies to 0 and 1. And the R, bra R predicate applies to nothing. OK. I propose to call it a day there. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I accept your pity applause. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> OK, that's it for today, everyone. Next time, we're just going to do exam review. So I have nothing further to teach you. We're going to go through what's on the exam in detail, and I'll show you examples of what every type of question will look like. Okay. Thanks, everyone.